In 1861, Virginians were living close to Thomas Jefferson's ideal of the yeoman farmer. They kept 11.5 million acres of land worth over $370 million under cultivation, more than any other state in the Confederacy, and more than most states in the Union. On those farms, they worked and fed 4 million head of livestock worth $48 million. But far more valuable was what Virginians grew, wheat, rye, corn, and oats, fed men, animals, and markets alike. But the cotton that drove much of the Deep South scarcely grew here. Virginia's dynamo was a smelly weed. Tobacco had always powered Virginia's economy, but the coming of the war required change. In 1862, the Confederate Congress asked Virginians not to plant tobacco, but to plant corn instead, so necessary for feeding the armies. Some listened, some didn't. In 1863 and again in 1864, the General Assembly asked Virginians to plant corn rather than tobacco. But in some areas, safely behind the lines, people went ahead and planted that cash crop. In Danville, during the course of the war, tobacco growers would produce more than 124 million pounds of the crop. In fact, when the war ended, with much of Virginia in ruins, Danville was one of the few cities enjoying prosperity. Tobacco may have powered Virginia's economy, but most farmers in the Old Dominion during the war simply subsisted on their small holdings, feeding their families, marketing any surplus, and praying the Yankees did not pass their way. Um, if you can imagine a woman with small children uh, trying to maintain something of the farm production, the sound of, of cannon or knowing that there is a military engagement nearby and raise the question of whether they should even try to stay. But many of the letters talk about these are hard times, these are scary times, uh, and again, after 1863, you need to come home or else we're going to starve. Again, indicating uh, the need for the labor at home on the farms with the husbands gone. But the women and children were not enough to run Virginia's farms on their own or to produce the handmade goods that men now in the armies could no longer make. More than ever before, they had to rely on the contribution of other Virginians. On the eve of the Civil War, there were more free blacks in Virginia than anywhere else in North America except for Maryland. Of 251,000 free blacks in the South, most of them lived in Virginia. The free black experience was complex because free blacks lived in a society in which most people, 90% of black people lived in the society were slaves, so they had a host of special problems. They faced economic, they faced cultural, they faced social discrimination. Also, the free black experience was mostly an urban one. In fact, most of Virginia's free blacks lived in the cities of Petersburg, Alexander, Richmond, and Norfolk. They lived in urban areas because there they could find more employment and there were more opportunities for them to socialize with each other in the form of churches and benevolent clubs and other organizations for their benefit. But the war brought special hardships on free blacks because they were not trusted by white Confederates. They were con all considered to be possible Union spies. And so many free blacks kept a low profile during the war, or if they made any public statements, it was to support the Confederacy. Despite the deep roots in agriculture, Virginia was far ahead of the rest of the South on the road to industrialization. There were almost 5,000 manufacturing establishments of some kind in operation when the war started, making everything from leather harness to railroad track. More than 36,000 Virginians worked at some kind of manufacturing. In southwest Virginia, they mined iron, lead, coal, and salt. Elsewhere, they made soap and candles, furniture, boots and shoes, wool and cotton clothing, and even gas for street lamps. And in 1861, Virginians were already manufacturing weapons. Uh, between Richmond and Fredericksburg uh, lay the industrial heart of the Confederacy. The Tredegar Iron Works manufactured some 50,000 weapons of various kinds. Uh, almost 2,000 cannon were fabricated here, 75 million um, cartridges for use of the soldiers. The principal task of the Confederate armories, though, was to repair weapons that were captured on the battlefields. And over 300,000 of these weapons were uh, refurbished and issued. 
and added to them were approximately 200,000 weapons that were purchased overseas. And so this became then a, a, a storehouse, a manufacturing center, a workshop for the Confederacy. Some of the men working in the factories did not need coal dust and engine smoke to blacken their faces. As far as in the industrial sense is concerned, more industrialists hired more slaves to work during the Civil War because more white men in Virginia were away fighting in the Confederate Army. But industrial work had its hazards. Slaves were mistreated, they suffered from accidents or injuries, and in some cases they weren't even paid for their work because their wages went to their employers instead of to the slaves. But slaves worked in a variety of occupations in industry during the Civil War in Virginia. They worked at salt works, on canals, turnpikes, railroads, and hospitals. Their efforts enabled the Confederacy and Virginia to go on fighting the war much longer than it would have without them. Getting the raw materials to the foundries and factories and moving the munitions and rations to the armies required a complex transportation system to keep the war moving. Virginia had hundreds of miles of farm roads connecting rural hamlets, and in some marshy or densely wooded areas of northern Virginia, plank roads were made of boards laid atop split rails. But armies and heavy goods wagons needed something more. For the movement of major heavy goods, Virginians depended upon the James River Canal, which connected Richmond with the Shenandoah Valley. It was a vital artery of support for the movement of munitions, guns, even men at times. And in 1863, it'll be up the James River Canal that the body of Stonewall Jackson's brought home to Lexington. Even more important was the Valley Turnpike nearby. It was the only hard paved road in Virginia. It served as a natural avenue for invasion north and south. But more than that, it was the road on which tons of munitions and supplies were moved from one part of Virginia to another. Most of all this would be a war on rails. When the war began, Virginia had almost 1,800 miles of railroad track, with a network of lines connecting Richmond with the Potomac, the northern and central Shenandoah Valley, Danville, Lynchburg, and the southwest. And the Virginia and Tennessee line linked the Old Dominion with the Confederacy to the southwest. That was 1,800 miles of target for Yankee Raiders, hoping to disrupt military transportation and supply. In the long run, the railroads proved to be no better than the country through which they passed. The South was basically agricultural. Its wartime railroads were doomed to ultimate failure because of lack of repairs, no replacement part for equipment, and of course, the ever advancing Union armies with the destruction that they brought. More than just the fortunes of the Army rested on those railroads and factories, Virginia's struggling commerce and economy depended on manufacturing and transportation too. Virginians at home faced increasing shortages of consumer goods as the war went on. The Army simply absorbed everything that was available. And what remained to the civilians increasingly went up in supply, sometimes in astronomical amounts. A barrel of flour that cost $5 in 1861 might be $250 four years later. In some areas, inflation was as high as 6,000%, but at the same time, the average income of Confederate civilians in real buying power went down by 65%. They simply no longer had enough to pay for what they couldn't find in the stores anyhow. Somehow, amid the pressures of the conflict, they still found ways to feed the inner Virginian. More than 70% were literate to some degree, and the fact that they were at war did not stop the hunger of their minds for learning and entertainment. More than a dozen publishers and printers in Richmond kept books coming from their presses throughout the war, though the publications gradually grew smaller and fewer in number. In Richmond, theater continued throughout the war. Besides the classics, audiences saw comedies, romances, and especially patriotic dramas. Most popular of all was the outpouring of hundreds of new patriotic songs on sheet music. As with everything else, the war stunted the arts, but it could not quell Virginians' hunger for something finer than fighting. We think of the uh, newspapers as, as newspapers, but the newspaper offices and the print uh, acted also as, as printers, and they printed pamphlets, books, broadsides, 
uh, music, all kinds of things came out of newspaper offices in, in addition to book publishers. A lot of books, not surprisingly, addressed the subject of the war. You would expect that to be the case. A lot of the books were novels that were romances uh, written uh, about the war. A lot of others used the war as a, as a backdrop. Education went on as, as usual, as best it could. Most of the textbooks used by schools had been published in the North, so there was a whole industry throughout the South, partially in Virginia, to create spelling books, geography books, primers, English language, uh, books of every description, uh, specific to the needs of the South, usually with the name Southern or Confederate or Dixie in the title. Far more than books or pamphlets, Virginians read newspapers. It was their only window on the outside world. More than 300,000 Virginians bought daily or weekly papers, making them the best read citizens in the Confederacy and better read than two thirds of the Union. The Richmond press kept them informed and misinformed throughout the sectional crisis, sometimes calming, sometimes inflaming the public sentiment that eventually accepted secession and war. There were almost a thousand newspapers in the South at the beginning of the war. They, they dwindled in numbers as the war progressed. And the Daily South Carolinian out of Columbia, South Carolina, and the Charleston Mercury in Charleston, South Carolina were among the leaders. But because Richmond was the capital, the Richmond papers were among the most important in the Confederacy. And there were four uh, daily papers in Richmond when the war began. What appeared in those pages depended more than ever on getting current information quickly. The war saw a revolution in news gathering, and Virginians, with the war on their doorsteps for four years, got their news faster than anyone else in the Confederacy, and often faster than the Yankees. Virginians were hungry for news when the war began, and that hunger only became greater as the war went on. They relied first on the telegraph and secondly on the newspaper. The telegraph lines could get close to the armies so that fresh news from the front could be telegraphed back home to the newspapers that could then set it in type, print it, and send it out to the people. The newspapers faced problems of shortage of paper, shortage of ink, and of course their presses and type would run out. The telegraph faced even greater problems because it depended upon wire and the copper wire was in such short supply that oftentimes in the Confederacy and even here in Virginia, the wire was taken up from the telegraph lines to be put to military uses instead. By 1865, this kind of communication from the front had all but shut down. Of course, it was politics that started it all, and Virginia's press had played the part in fomenting the crisis. Ironically, politics and government would be one of the early casualties of the conflict. Only men voted or engaged in politics, and in Virginia, as elsewhere, the best men rushed to enlist early. It shouldn't be a surprise that in a war brought on by politics, the politics itself continued to be a pressing interest on the part of Virginians as that war progressed. But the war always impacted politics in a peculiar way. There were no longer enough men to run for office because all the best men were in the army. There weren't always enough voters because most of the men who were voters were also in the army. The issues remained the same, how to maintain roads, how to keep the militia going, how to raise taxes for public projects. But everywhere the pressing demands of the war made it all an uphill battle. State government in Richmond was just as precarious Legislators were constantly aware that their city and themselves were a target for Yankee armies. In 1862, McClellan's army came within sight of the State House. From June 1864 until the end, the governor and legislature lived with the distant sound of guns. And in February 1864, political leaders were themselves the target of a Union cavalry raid that almost penetrated the city's defenses. By then, the old political parties had broken down into factions, as the only political issue that mattered anymore was the war. Perhaps the greatest irony of the war for Virginia government is that a state that in part left the old Union out of resistance to the idea of a strong centralized authority, that very state, by the end of the war, 
became the most centralized authority in its history. By 1865, the Confederacy lived only in its soldiers. When Lee surrendered in April, there was virtually nothing else left of Virginia to resist the Federals. The fields had all been converted from cash crops like tobacco to corn for men and animals, but there was no army. The railroads were worn out or too disrupted to supply the soldiers, and now there were no soldiers. The banks had failed or closed. All of the deposits in the Richmond banks left the capital with the fleeing government. The politicians were all run away or gone home to await their fates, and the people were tired of the men who helped bring them to this calamity. The newspapers were all in Yankee hands now, and even the most patriotic editors could not put a gloss on the destruction all around them. There was never any question that as a major battleground of the war, Virginia was going to suffer a great deal of destruction. Most eloquent, perhaps, of course, is what happened here in Richmond. But the destruction of these factories came at the end of the war. Far more eloquent was what happened county by county throughout the course of the war, as each Virginia county became the object of Yankee raids. And that is where Virginia broke down. In just one raid in Loudoun County in 1864, more than 1,200 barns were destroyed. 10,000 head of livestock were taken, and 80 flour and sawmills were ruined. With destruction like that on the home front, Virginians could no longer sustain even themselves, let alone their army in the field. But the most poignant testimony to the devastation lay not in ruined buildings or closed shops. It was in the empty fields and streets and the unfilled places in tens of thousands of homes. It was an absence with no regard for wealth or station. Grand planters' mansions and rude mountaineers' cabins all shared in the same congress of vacant chairs. Virginia's crop was a different one now, seed planted that would never rise from the earth again. 